I'm not going to go through them all in huge detail, but I just thought it's useful to have a pack that sort of highlights some things. And we'll just do the potted version of what contract law might look like. So, firstly, just to remind you, this subject is all about identifying <coughs> whether we have a contract or not. And so, effectively, I think of this as coming from two points of view. Um, mostly, we approach it from the fighter's point of view, working out whether there's a contract from the point of view of whether or not somebody can sue on that contract. Um, so, by working out whether there's a contract, we work out whether the client has an obligation or a right. But again, from the lover's point of view, from the transactional lawyer's point of view, understanding what the elements of a contract are help us write the contracts, make sure that we know what it is that we need to include. So basically the way this whole subject has been structured is by starting with the question, is there a contract, working out if there was, whether the formalities, if any, were complied with. We then go and ask ourselves whether there is any issue with capacity and then assuming that there are no vitiating factors that are going to impact the contract that we have found, we then go deeper into what the terms of the contract are. Now, um, again, I was talking to somebody on my drive in here and one of the issues that often comes up um, and I think it's easy to see is particularly when we're looking at these, um, sorry, down the bottom, when we're looking at what the terms of the contract are, particularly if we're getting ourselves into the parole evidence rule and into questions of whether terms that have been expressed in some way should be captured in the contract or not, it can be very hard to distinguish between that and questions that go to certainty. Okay, that's not a bad thing to notice how those things overlap. And again, if there is a question in the exam which might be read as a certainty question but might be read as a question about what the terms of the contract are, um, if you've got a sensible approach to it, chances are just looking at one or other of those things will still get you a good result. Um, it may well be that a really brilliant result will uh, come from looking at one of those elements and then going for the, with the even if, or if that, if that isn't the case, we still need to think about X, okay? So if it, the thing about life is life rarely fits neatly into the boxes that we try and fit it into. Um, and we have this structured approach for looking at it, but problems could fit across different areas. That happens a lot. So the formation elements are these, you say them in your sleep, no doubt, offer and acceptance, which together are agreement. Sometimes we can't actually identify the offer that is matched with an acceptance. So in such circumstances, Bramble shows us that we can look for evidence, objective evidence that the parties have reached some kind of consensus. The other issue that comes up here quite a lot is whether or not there has been an offer that is matched with a corresponding acceptance. To be an offer, an offer needs to contain what I call the DNA of the deal. So it needs to be capable of creating a contract just by being accepted. An acceptance needs to not vary that offer in any way because otherwise it's a counter offer and a counter offer Basically, by rejecting an offer, it basically goes away. The next element is consideration, which really goes to the question of bargain, whether or not there is an exchange of promises. Um, early on, we sometimes refer to consideration as price, and often that's all it is. I promise to dig your garden, you promise to pay me for that. So it's easy to point to the price, um, but it's not the price that is consideration. Consideration is the promise to pay the price. If you fail to pay the price, you have failed to meet the obligation under the agreement that was created in part by that consideration. Intention. 
Intention really goes to the question of whether the parties intended that there would be legal consequences for their bargain. That is the intention that they would be able to go to a court if somebody didn't keep their promise. Now, when you think about that in any depth, you realise actually that's kind of crazy in some ways. If I talk about buying a cup of coffee in that cafe downstairs, we can go through what the legal elements are for the making of the contract. But if the cafe owner were to hand me a cup of coffee and then I basically scarp it away without paying, he's more likely to call the police and accuse me of a crime than he is to sue me in contract. Why? Because for a $4.50 cup of coffee, it's just not worth his time and effort, right? And I'm more a nuisance than anything else. Um, so does that mean he never intended it to be a legally binding or a relationship? Probably not. It's, you know, he's not giving away coffees, right? He's selling coffees and if you take the coffee without paying for it, that is stealing. But it's also a breach of contract because you have made an offer to buy a coffee for a price. That offer has been accepted, so you have a contract. There is a consideration there, a promise to pay $4.50 or whatever it is. Um, there is certainty as to what the deal is, $4.50, exchange for a freshly made cup of coffee. Um, there is an intention that that is a standard contractual relationship, um, but whether or not actually enforcing it by suing in contract is the most efficient way of doing it. So, um, And then certainty. Have, and there's three limbs to certainty. We'll come back to them. But really, this is around whether the parties have clearly identified the rights and responsibilities they have. And it is, as I was just saying earlier, very closely linked in with this idea of what the terms are. And again, even though we've done it in this kind of linear way, often, in order to really work out if there's an offer, we need to be sufficiently certain that the offer has all of the DNA of the deal so it can be accepted. So it's not necessarily a step-by-step -step process <coughs> in real life. Uh, the other thing with offer and acceptance, um, Bramble's when we don't have a clear offer matching with an acceptance, we can use the test in brambles, which is can an agreement be inferred from the conduct of the parties? Have the parties um, manifested mutual assent to that agreement? And would a reasonable person having the same information using an objective test conclude that a bargain had been struck? And if we can see all of those things, we can have agreement even if we can't point to offer and matching acceptance. So, working through the issues of whether there is an agreement or not, we start, we've started with, is there an offer? We use an objective test to work out whether there is an offer. We did that by exploring things that looked a bit like offers but might not be. For example, puffs, invitations to treat, supplying information or answering questions. Um, auctions and tenders, though, are opportunities for people bidding or responding to tender documents to make offers. The auction and the tender is really an offer itself, although you'll remember the case of Havela, the Canadian case. Uh, I think it's Havela and Mutual Trust or something similar to that where because of the way the tender was worded, the tender itself was an offer, effectively. They were offering to accept the highest price. Um, we also might find it useful to distinguish between a bilateral and a unilateral contract. Tread with care. It's rarely, most contracts are bilateral contracts. It's very rarely interesting with that it's a bilateral contract. When it's interesting is when it's not, when it's a unilateral contract. And a unilateral contract is interesting because during the life of the contract, only one party has obligations. The contract itself is made by the offeree 
accepting the offer by doing the thing. Um, we also need to work out whether the offer can be revoked and whether it has in fact been revoked. Once we've thought about the offer, then we can work out whether it's been accepted or not. Again, we use an objective test. Um, we explored what things constitute acceptance. We learnt that you can't accept just by remaining completely silent, but you don't need to do very much more than that if objectively it's clear that you have assented. Um, we also discussed the importance of communicating acceptance and the ways that acceptance can be communicated. And we also then explored what happens when the offer and the acceptance don't correspond exactly. So that's cases like Butler Tools and Brambles um, and uh, the Battle of the Forms type cases. So, um, often a dispute as to the existence of an agreement will turn on whether an offer was even made in the first place. So that's the circumstance when you need to be able to distinguish a path for an invitation to treat, etc. How do we terminate offers? Um, I'm just going to pop these all out. I thought this is quite a friendly slide. Whoops turns them into three different areas uh, and sets out how an offer can be revoked, that an offer can lapse, or importantly, that an offer can be rejected. So an offer, oh, offers are like, I don't know, Tinder dates. You reject them too quickly, they're never coming back. Um, questions, concerns? I'm just waiting, oh, Harry. Yep, yep, yep. Sorry, I just wanted to be able to talk to these ones because I don't want you to panic. But by you looking for the slides, you're panicking. Yep, there. As soon as we finish talking about them, I will hit that button. Okay. Um, it's worth thinking about conditions precedent and conditions subsequent. So, if a contract is subject to a condition precedent, the parties have agreed that they will only have obligations to each other when that condition precedent to their obligations arising has been fulfilled. Um, a condition subsequent usually is an external event that will bring the contract to an end. So a condition precedent, a good example might be we agree all of the terms of our arrangement, but it's subject to finance. So the purchaser needs to get finance on terms that they're happy with before the contract will uh, commence. But they might also say, okay, we've got a binding contract, but I can get out of it, condition subsequent, if I don't get finance that I'm happy with. So similar approach, but one is binding already, so it means the vendor can't sell to somebody else. Uh, the other one, it might be, there might still be a period of time that they have to keep their arrangement open, but there's no binding contract until this other event happens. So a good example I've probably used in class is if you are a foreign investor, uh, and you want to buy really big things in Australia. So I think if you're an American and you want to spend, is it 20 billion or something? 20, it's a huge amount of money these days. Um, you want to invest in something, but the number's big enough, you can only do that if the treasurer under the Foreign Investment Review Board rules has said that they're not going to object to your investment. But it is actually, an offence to enter into a contract until you know that the treasurer won't object. So I could explain why, but hey, come to M&A and we'll talk about it there. Um, but that would be a condition precedent to making the contract. We can't have any obligations in place because it would be a crime to do that until the condition precedent has been satisfied. So. 
Um, acceptance. In order to actually have an agreement, we need an offer, and that offer needs to be accepted while it's still open, and the acceptance needs to be communicated. Okay, so accepting in your head is not good enough. <coughs> um, next topic that we moved into was consideration. So remember we spent two whole weeks there and I just did it in, what, ten minutes or something or other? Really, what were we doing, slackers that we were? Um, consideration, a little bit more woolly in my mind map here, but basically we need to go down the two different um, arcs. So in order to work out whether there is legally sufficient consideration, which by the way is only relevant or is not relevant if we have a deed. Okay? So if we've got a standard arrangement like a verbal contract or a contract in writing that is not styled as a deed, then we need to ensure that we meet the benefit detriment requirement and the consideration must be part of this bargain. So these are two obligations that we need to meet, two sides of the one coin. Um, so in order to work out if there's legally sufficient consideration, going down this wing, we need to look at whether the promises confer a benefit <coughs> and create a detriment. And down the other side, we need to be able to distinguish exchange from reliance. So there needs to be an exchange of promises, not something that is done in reliance on some past event. Then, because we do this, we look at these maxims and we look at the range of acceptance. So consideration needs to move from the promisee, it doesn't necessarily have to move to the promisor. It needs to be adequate, no it doesn't. It needs to be sufficient, but it doesn't need to be adequate. So the Courts will not inquire, for the most part, into whether or not you paid the right price. They inquire into whether you paid a price. So whether the promise you made is a fair promise or not, they don't care. But you must have made a promise in exchange for the promises that you have got. Past consideration is not good consideration. Again, that goes straight to this idea of bargain Something that you did in the past is not good consideration for a promise that is made to you later on. Not for a legally enforceable agreement. It might be a good moral promise. I've always been nice to you up until now, so you should be nice to me in the future. Um, but it doesn't work for contract. Part payment of a debt is not good consideration for a promise to waive the balance of that debt. You need new consideration for a new promise. And performance of a pre-existing legal duty won't be good consideration. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh. Oh, I don't like doing that. I saw a documentary when I was a kid about how somebody's brain exploded. <laughs> Sneezing, holding in a sneeze, and it makes me anxious now. Intentions to create legal relations. As a general rule, we need to see a voluntary assumption of a legally enforceable duty. This goes back to the stuff that we spoke about in the first week. Remember I said, really frustrating first week, guys, because there's all of this reading, we're hardly going to talk about it, but we're going to keep coming back to it in this roundabout way. And we kept doing that. Um, this idea that contract creates a private law between individuals. And so we need to demonstrate that intention. Um, so we kind of have two wings here where there is an express statement that there is intention. Um, we don't really have an issue. And often that's just a good drafting ploy, is when we're creating an agreement to actually have a statement. Often you see it at the very beginning. Um, those of you who went in and looked at some example contracts in the Encyclopedia of Forms and Precedents, we see they're often set out with the names of the parties and then a section, which is often headed up background or recitals. Um, and then it goes into the operative provisions. And the recitals or the background will often say, this agreement relates to Fred's promise to take Wilma shopping. 
and Wilma has agreed to be taken shopping on the following conditions and the parties intend that their agreement will be binding. That was the most ridiculous example. They're getting worse and worse. You'd think I'd get better at examples over time, but so far, no evidence of that. Um, so if there's no express um, statement, ultimately, since Irma Genus, all we know is that there are these rebuttable presumptions that are easily rebutted and they effectively go to the onus of proof. So if your relationship is a commercial one and you want to say that there was never any intention that this is a binding agreement, then the onus will be on the party who wants to show that there is no agreement, that there was no intention. The onus will be on them to prove that. If your relationship is a social or a family relationship and you want to sue on the agreement, the onus will be on you to bring evidence, if there is a dispute about it, that there was an intention to be legally bound. The other thing, and I'm sure all of you are more familiar with this than you thought you would ever be after the second assignment, this Masters and Cameron question of, we've got a preliminary agreement here and now I'm going to speak very slowly and thoughtfully because you have a term sheet that has been given to you for preparation for this exam, right? It's headed up term sheet. So I would be thinking that the Masters and Cameron categories might be of some interest to you. Beyond that, I say no more. Where does it get difficult? For intention, things like honour clauses. Uh, letters of comfort. Remember with letters of comfort, we looked at two cases decided pretty much in the same year on two different sides of the world with almost identical facts, but not quite. Two very, very different results. Okay, that's kind of interesting, I think. Um, <coughs> this slide's in the wrong place, but it is a good slide. I like this one because I think that Justice Kirby's decision in Woolworths and Kelly really helps us understand why consideration <coughs> doesn't need to be adequate or why the courts <coughs> will not inquire. So that gives you some hints as to what to look at there. Um, in relation to intention, what things are relevant? We didn't spend a lot of time talking about Dr Shaheed and the <laughs> dermatologist club, did we? Um, but that is quite a good case to really get your head around intention. Um, and I think that that would be a useful thing for you to think about the criteria that was used in that case for determining whether or not there was intention in something that might have looked like a, a, a non-commercial relationship. Another case that, actually this is the first semester for a very long time where I haven't had agonisingly long conversations about woolen mills. It's not too late. They happen every time. For some reason woolen mills is a case that has frustrated people over and over again. And in that case, they were looking at the question of whether or not there was intention. It is relevant that it is a case that involves the government. Okay, um, the Lai and the Territory of Papua New Guinea, might be Papua New Guinea and Lai, something like that, similar sort of case. But again, these four factors are relevant in our thinking about entering into an agreement with the government. Okay, again, you've got a little bit of scope knowing about the exam anyway here. Um, I've told you who the parties in your scenario are um, and I'll tell you now that despite that episode where Lisa became the president, she now thinks the office is sullied and no longer wants that job. So you don't need to worry too much about that. Presumptions, homogeneous, we have spoken about that already. I don't need to say anything more here, do I? Please stop me if I'm just rabbiting on, being confusing. Certainty, three limbs to certainty. Okay, make sure that you understand the differences and that you can address them. Um, a contract can fail for a lack of certainty because it is incomplete. 
that it is missing an essential term or a condition because it is vague or ambiguous or because it is illusory. In other words, that the um, promises that are made are illusory promises, that there is actually no consideration. And again, by the time we're getting here, it might be that there is a question that looks like a certainty question because we're talking about illusory promises, but it might also fail for a lack of consideration. So look at it from both angles. Um, again, essential terms, working out what they are. I think I've got a slide in that a sec. Again, what's really important in this area is working out, well, what can be happen if we find we have a certainty issue? Because even though it's a formation element, it might be that that gap can be filled anyway. So don't just toss the baby out with the bath, bath water. We've got some uncertainty here. Look at whether the contract could continue in a sensible way when the uncertain element is addressed. Uh, yep, sorry, there's just the same thing. Um, essential terms. <laughs> What the essential terms are will deter uh, be determined by what the contract is, what the subject matter is. It's very rare for it not to include these things, who the parties are, what the subject matter of the contract is. We need to actually know what we're agreeing. The price or some mechanism for determining it and usually time periods when things have to be done by. But not always. Time periods might be determined quite easily as being within a reasonable time. And what a reasonable time will be will depend on the subject matter. So in a reasonable time to deliver a crate full of composting worms might be quite different from a reasonable time to build a house. OK, formalities. Now, this is important to remember that when we're talking about agreements and contract, it is very easy to use the verb or the noun and not be clear which you're talking about. And that's what I want to remind you again, that I have given you a document that will be part of the exam. Just because I've given you a document doesn't mean that it is definitely a contract. And it might be a contract in one scenario and not in another. It might be in all three scenarios that it is a contract or it isn't a contract. Um, so when we're talking about the term itself. Um, so we can have an agreement. The question will become, do we need that agreement to be in writing? And in a certain limited number of circumstances, if it is not in writing, it cannot be enforced. So understanding what those circumstances are and being able to articulate that is really important. And it's, it's hard to do. As in the tute last night, one of the quiz questions we were looking at was effectively to plain English, section 126 of the Evidence Act, uh, sorry, the Instruments Act, and which is the successor to the uh, statute of fraud provisions in Victoria. And it's hard to do. Like, I find it hard to do. But ultimately, we have to remember, in Victoria in particular, if it's in right, uh, if it relates to land or it relates to a guarantee, then it needs to, if you want to sue on it, it needs to be in writing and signed by the person you want to sue, which ends up in that funny position where if Harry tries to sell me his land, and I sign the contract, but he doesn't. Um, he can sue me if I don't pay the purchase price, but I can't sue him if he doesn't hand over the title deeds because he hasn't signed the document. Sorry, you're the furthest one away from me, so I just thought I would make you the bad guy in that arrangement today. Um, the kinds of contracts. Basically, we've gone through these. All of these are still relevant to some extent in Tasmania, but we're going to deal with the uh, law of Victoria. And so contracts of guarantee and contracts for the sale of the interest in land are the ones that continue. So that's from the Statute of Frauds itself. <coughs> um, but there are other pieces of legislation that now require certain kinds of contracts to be in writing. You just need to know that in broad sense and you need to go and look for that occasionally when you're in practice. 
So they include things like door-to-door -door sales. If, you, if you're going to buy something because somebody's come and knock on your door, they have to leave you a written contract with a cooling off period in it. Um, and there are certain other types of telecommunication contracts, for example. Specific legislation will address that. Um, these are the five key questions that can arise when, to, when you're addressing whether a document will satisfy the statute. So the statute of frauds here is our shorthand language. We tend to talk about the provisions that are in existence now as being successors to the statute or the statute of fraud. It's kind of nice. Um, so, and they go to things like whether or not you can identify who the parties are, uh, at what time the document needed to be created. So the shorthand there, if you'd say an agreement that uh, is documented in writing, then it's on the signing of that agreement that the contract is made. Uh, and so that needed to be brought into existence before the agreement was made. But if it's a memorandum or note of agreement, it needs to be made after the agreement is made because it's recording something that happened. Um, you are not limited to only one document. Um, we can have a joinder of documents. Sorry, I will get... I'm, I'm going way too slow, aren't I? Sorry, I just really wanted to get through all of this. You're being very patient with me. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't get through them all. Uh, signature, we have the authenticated signature fiction. We don't need to have a lot of fuss and bother about signature. Um, and we remember from about our first or second class that email and electronic formats are, as a consequence of uh, the Electronic Transactions Act, they are documents. Trick for young players that I see a lot is the Electronic Transaction Act, the Commonwealth Act, that relates to dealings with the Commonwealth. It's the state acts that relate to ordinary transactions in each of the states. Okay, how about we take a five minute break to stretch your legs and do what you need to do and we'll finish off these slides because I am at slide 22. So there's a few more to go. Everybody happy to do that? Five minutes, five two, we'll come back. I'm just going to pause for you at home and it'll continue as the same um, recording, I hope. <laughs> So, we've got to topic seven. Capacity. Capacity is not a formation element. Um, it's only relevant if we know we've got a contract, whether or not, then we look at whether or not all of the parties have capacity. So, if a party doesn't have capacity, that means the contract's void, right? No. No, it does not. It just means that you might have trouble enforcing it against the party who doesn't have capacity or suffers an incapacity. Um, so we always need to go back to what all of the elements are. We think about formalities and we think about capacity in that context. So capacity can be raised as an issue across a range of different areas. We spend most of our time talking about minors and people who suffer some kind of mental incapacity. Um, it's there on the slide. It's unlikely to be relevant to you. But in relation to corporations, the question is rarely whether they have capacity or not, just whether or not the right person has sign documents for them. Um, and again, unincorporated associations and partnerships don't have capacity. Bankrupts do have some limited capacity uh, within the scope of the bankruptcy law. Um, so we focus up the top there. Um, this was my long-winded process for working out what the problem, uh, where the problems arise in relation to minors. Most of our time we spent looking at what a necessity or a necessary is and beneficial employment contracts, which ultimately are binding. So if they fall within this reign, we don't have a problem. When we have a permanent continuous subject matter, 
Then, so that's things like shares or land. It's likely to be binding and less repudiated, which means it's voidable. In Victoria, that effectively means, because you can't repudiate, um, that they're not going to be binding. Um, so that is why it's very hard to, for um, people under the age of 18 to own land without actually having some sort of nominee standing in front of them or shares. Um, and really the only way that they ever end up in that position because you can't actually fill out the paperwork uh, is when um, shares or land are inherited and usually they need to have a trustee stand in or a guardian stand in and hold until they reach their languages majority. Um, again, pretty much everything else, it's not binding unless ratified, but in Victoria, the Supreme Court Act says, yeah, don't care. That's what the common law says. But at the end of the day, we're not going to look at ratification. You can't ratify. We need a new contract at that stage. Um, yep. What else do we want to say here? Oh, I don't know why it's doing that. It's trying to change colour and not working. I completely messed up my slide with the colours. Uh, privity. Privity, we race through like nobody's business. Most of the chapter that you had to read uh, talked about why um, in the UK they're getting rid of privity altogether and what the problems are with privity. Most of the time we're looking at ways to circumvent privity. There are two elements to this idea that contracts are private laws and can only be enforced by people who are parties to them. Um, on one side there is that only the parties can get the benefits of the contract and on the other side you can only enforce the obligation against somebody who is a party. Key ways of circumventing privity. Promisee may hold rights under a contract on trust for someone else. So again, if I enter into a contract that somebody else gets the benefit of, I can do so as a kind of trustee and be effectively required to uh, sue on that contract if I'm asked to by the beneficiary. The beneficiary might be entitled to assert an estoppel against the promisor, so there might be some basis in equity that would prevent the promisor from exercising a right because of the reliance that had been placed. The beneficiary might be entitled to claim damages for misleading or deceptive conduct, or the beneficiary might be entitled to claim damages in tort. On the whole, the lovers amongst us are going to try and make sure that we get the parties right from the very beginning, or we make it clear if somebody is entering into a contract as an agent for somebody else, because then the beneficiary or the principal under the agency arrangement will actually be a party to the contract from the very beginning. Or in relation to the kind of contracts where we saw this issue came up, like the stevedoring contracts or insurance contracts, we're drafting the contracts to make it clear that the person who has privity is obliged to act effectively as a trustee to put their name behind a suit if uh, somebody else in the chain needs to sue under the contract. Um, so we went through the exceptions. Um, again, I think probably here rather than go through them one by one, reading the chapter is a good idea. And then, it's only three weeks ago, believe it or not, <laughs> we got to the end where actually we started to explore what the terms of the contract are. We looked at express terms, we looked at implied terms, we started to explore the idea of understanding what the terms are and we had a little peek at the parole evidence rule. So express terms, that's about working out when a term that is discussed during a negotiation becomes a term. We looked at the kind of language that is used. So in JJ Savage, we looked at that use of the word estimate or opinion, which doesn't, according to the High Court anyway, suggest a promise. Um, Oscar Chess and Williams also, where that's the one where the, uh, the guy sold his mother's 
Morris Minor that turned out to be 10 years older than he thought it was. He was basically relying on the information that he had. Uh, relative, relative expertise of the parties. Again, if you're selling a car to a used car dealership, you can usually expect that they will know more about the cars than you do, or than I do. Um, but again, the other way around, um, if you are selling a car, if you are buying a car from a used car salesperson, you can usually expect that they know more about cars than you do. Um, the importance of the term. So that's the Van den Eschert and Chapel case, the one where the guy asked right at the last moment, I didn't check for white ants, I better go away and do that. And he was told, no, there's no problem with white ants here. If there had been, I would have done something about it. The importance of the statement and the timing of the statement went to it becoming an enforceable promise. Uh, timing there as well. Um, is there a written contract or not? Again, parole evidence rule pops in here as well, but when you have a written agreement, and that is different from and subsequent to things that were said in a negotiation, then a court is going to assume that the negotiations moved on and that the, they're going to look at the written agreement, that it trumps. And then we have this catch-all, any other relevant factor, which again, we're just applying an objective test. What else have I got here? Um, Implied terms. Terms will be implied to fill gaps, but there are some limitations. Um, the term itself needs to be consistent with the express terms. It can't contradict an express term. It fills a gap. It can't undermine what's expressed. That's consistent with the parole evidence rule as well. Um, we looked at entire agreement clauses. Um, an implied term will not necessarily be defeated by an entire agreement clause, but if the clause itself says implied terms are excluded, they might be defeated, except for one particular type of implied term, and a term in particular that might be implied by statute. What would that be? <coughs> the implied term that in class you have to speak loudly enough for me to hear. The consumer law. So, or the, uh, the prohibition against misleading or deceptive conduct. So, if in fact your term that induced a contract was, or your statement was misleading or deceptive, and uh, we saw with Nifsan and Buskey that a very well drafted uh, uh, entire agreement clause was not enough to push that to one side. Um, some implied terms might be required by law and not capable of exclusion. In particular, as Stephen was just saying, terms that arise out of the Australian consumer law, in particular the consumer guarantees, for example, or the provisions in relation to cooling off in door-to-door -door sales contract. Um, and there is um, a claim that an implied term uh, is part of the contract will not be impeded by the parole evidence rule. That is because the parole evidence rule effectively says thou shalt not, when one has an entire agreement that is in writing, bring in evidence of any oral or other conduct that might, uh, that uh, negates or varies the written. But if we have implied terms, then by their very nature, we are establishing that it is not an entire agreement in writing, that the term is made up of some things that are in writing and some other things as well. Okay, so when we're working out what the implied terms are, the key cases were uh, cases BP Refinery, which is basically a modern version of the Moorcock decision. Um, so, the terms, terms that are implied in fact need to be reasonable and equitable, they need to be necessary to give business efficacy, they need to be so obvious it goes without saying, they need to be able to be clearly expressed and they cannot contradict expressed terms. So they need to meet those criteria before the court will fill that gap for a term that's implied in fact. 
Terms that are implied by law need to be applicable to a definable class of contractual relationship and necessary. So there's a bit of discussion about the difference between business efficacy and necessity. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think you need to worry about that too much at this stage. Um, so we look at a particular class of contracts. So let me give you an example. It is an implied term in all contracts between solicitors and their clients that solicitors will keep their clients' information confidential. <coughs> so now there might be, there are some rules about why we can't actually get rid of that, but just say I am your solicitor, I'm Steve's solicitor, and then subsequently I, we enter into a separate business arrangement. Um, in relation to the separate business, we, we buy a house together and we rent it out. And I do the tax returns. And he can't come to me and say, you can't tell the tax, to the, uh, tax department about how much rent we're getting because you're my solicitor and it is an implied term of our client-solicitor relationship that you have to keep my secrets. Um, but it's a separate arrangement. It's probably a separate arrangement that we shouldn't have entered into because there are all sorts of conflicts of interest possibilities there, and that's, but that's for a different subject. For this example, it's fine, okay? Terms implied in law as opposed to fact, there's a general pro a presumption against implying terms into written contracts. The more detailed the contract is, the less likely the court is to think that it needs to step in and deal with adding in a term. As a general rule, if the court can make sense of it, it will. Um, we also have, um, we have this maxim, this, uh, um, the uh, contra preferentum rule, do you remember that one? So effectively, we read the term in the absence of really clear language, we read the term narrowly against the person who has the benefit of it, the proferens. Terms implied by custom or trade usage are the kinds of terms that are generally known, uniform, reasonable and certain. Um, so they need to be notorious, they need to be consistent, you don't actually have to know about them. If you've never ever bought insurance brokerage before or worked with an insurance broker before, you might not know that there are terms of art that are used in brokerage, but they still need to be notorious in the industry, consistent across the industry. And it's a question of fact whether they exist or not. In order for a term to be implied, the following conditions must be fulfilled. The term will need to be reasonable and equitable. So I, ideally it's, you know, the, the court will just put it in for efficacy, so it needs to be a reasonable, equitable term. It needs to be necessary to give business efficacy so that no term will be implied if a contract can exist without it. The courts are loath to fill in gaps unless they really need to. The term, ideally, is so obvious that it goes without saying. You remember this idea of the officious bystander referred to in Burn and Australian Airlines from memory, this idea. I've always got this, this neighbour of mine in my head when I think of that. You know, he's like, oh, we're about to have our body corporate meeting at the moment and he's like writing emails about whether the notices have gone out on time or not. It's like, you know, it's on Facebook, nobody cares. Um, it must be capable of clear expression and it mustn't contradict an express term. So when we have terms that are implied by law or implied by um, custom, if the lovers amongst us don't want that term, then we can, be ex we can expressly exclude them in the agreement. They don't have to be in every agreement unless the statute says they have to be. Uh, and these conditions can overlap. Uh, what else is there? Yeah, I think we've spoken about all of those things so far. I want to do some quiz questions, so I'm going a bit quickly. Exclusion clauses, that was only last week, but always just start with, are these, is, are, are we trying to exclude something that's in a statute? In particular, if it's the Australian Consumer Law or otherwise. Um, 
if the statute says that you can't exclude it, then the limitation will be void and we can stop there. But if it doesn't, then we need to go to the common law test. So what is the common law test? Firstly, we work out, is this restriction actually incorporated into the agreement <coughs> in some way or not? Or is it, is it not? Which is going back to the stuff earlier on about certainty uh, and what the terms of the contract are. Secondly, is the person who is relying on, the con on this clause, uh, are they privy to the contract or not? We need both of those things to be true before the clause will apply to the issue that's in dispute. The framework that I have is effectively this. Does the legislation apply? Let's assume that it doesn't. If the clause is properly incorporated into the contract, let's assume that it does. If the party is seeking to reply is party of the contract, let's hope they are, then as a matter of construction, does the clause exclude or reduce the liability in an appropriate way? So effectively, we go straight to each of these areas. So we're really pulling all of that together in one go. Even when a contract itself is unenforceable, the dealings between the parties can still give rise to enforceable rights. We didn't spend a lot of time here. Um, it is not hugely relevant to the exam that you have, but I think you need to be aware of this slide and its contents and be able to point to these things if you need to. Um, so we've had a couple of cases where we've looked at reliance, where we've looked at part performance, where the statute hasn't been involved, um, and in particular in relation to severance. I don't believe we ever discussed restitution as such. So restitution occurs when benefits that one party has um, might be subject to a claim. So where one party has done something or has ended up creating something but there is no contract, can things be restored back to the position that they were in? Again, particularly important now, but it is a concept that you will get uh, quite a lot of thinking time with in advance contract. Okay, so I lied. There's a couple more slides. Only two. That was number 40. Um, Constructive trusts and equitable estoppel. So equitable estoppel is not in this subject. It's in the next one. But we keep hearing that language, right? It's in half the cases almost refer to an equitable estoppel in one way. So I just want to make sure that you know what an equitable estoppel is and you can explore it in more depth in advanced contract. So um, a party can rely on an equitable estoppel if, uh, if there has been some kind of reliance or some kind of unfairness that means that equity will stop a, the other party from exercising the right that they have in common law. So the example that I've used here comes out of looking at formalities, in particular the statute of fraud and ensuring equity will ensure that the statute of fraud isn't used for the opposite intention, which is taking advantage of somebody not understanding how the law works effectively when they're trying to purchase land and they're not actually getting the benefit of that. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I hope that didn't hurt your ears. And then the last thing I want to mention, I mentioned right at the very beginning, it is useful for you to have as many of these different classification tools as you can because particularly if your temptation is to write WTF and nothing more as an answer, go to, okay, what classifications could I use here? What different ways are there of looking at this problem in some way? Questions, concerns, frustrations? Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but it's very easy to find one. I'm sure I can go and have a look and give you something pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but um, I think actually in the consideration cases, um, you'll see that come up fairly early on. Um, it is worth noting, and, and you'll, 
it, when you do equity and trust, you'll find this a little bit frustrating because it's like, we've got a deed and Kat says we don't need consideration. But equity works on these maxims, you know. It's like, I think of equity as sort of this old Buddha somewhere just coming out with inspirational statements that just annoy you. And one of them is equity will not assist a volunteer. So, even though, so we've got this idea of consideration and this idea that consideration doesn't need to be sufficient, uh, sorry, it doesn't need to be adequate, it doesn't need to be valuable, but it just needs to be sufficient. So we can have an agreement and, you know, I can sell you my house for a dollar as long as we've documented that the appropriate way and that's the consideration. Um, if we had a deed, I could do it for zero, um, which is fine, but then subsequently if it turned out that there was some inequity in that, the common law wouldn't care. Private law, we're grown-ups, we can enter into our own arrangements, presuming you haven't been misleading or deceptive or there is no fraud or anything like that. At the end of the day, that's our agreement. But in relation to equity, equity will say, well, yeah, we don't need consideration. But if you're a volunteer, if you haven't really actually got any skin in the game, then we might not help you. So it gets very frustrating. Anything more? <coughs> All right. I'm actually going to finish here rather than do quiz questions because we are right at the end. I have... I'm going to share the quiz with you all up front because it's quite a fun one. You can randomly pick different pop culture references and get a question and a clock will tick and then you can write an answer. Um, I will start doing some of those in the tute on Sunday night. My plan is to put that time aside for tutes until the exams are over. Um, if nobody shows up within 10 minutes or so, I'll probably pour myself a glass of wine. Um, but yeah, so I'm thinking I'm going to head to the Oxford Scholar now and have a glass of wine. If any of you would like to join me, you would be very I would be very happy about that. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you guys this semester. I'm sorry we have two, only two hours to get through so much, but we get through it, right? And you guys are doing awesome, so congratulations. I hope to not see any of you in this class ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'll give you that.